Assalamu alaikum and shukran for tuning into this week's Anur the Light. Johannesburg remains a city of gold as we still find some gems coming out of the city. Take for instance Nasreen Chamda, a baker extraordinaire whose cakes and desserts are nothing short of amazing. Baking is by any means an art and requires skill as well as know-how. Combining ingredients and creating a masterpiece takes time, and Nazreen Chamda is fast becoming a master in this. She's been a finalist on an internationally branded TV show and is very proud of how far she's come with something that she picked up as a child at her mom's side. I would say that my love for baking began when I was very young. Uh, my mom's a dermatologist, and you know, she was actually studying when she had uh, myself, my brother, and my sister. and. We would always find that baking together would be like our special time, you know. It's very different when you're doing homework, um, when you're just sitting on the couch and doing something. And when mommy and I used to bake, it was just something magical that happened in the kitchen. And I'll never forget the feeling that I got because it's the same feeling I have every single time I step into that kitchen, you know. And it's just sheer joy and, and, and love for what I do. And um, yeah, so it started at a very young age. We, you know, we had those kiddo cookbooks and like on a Friday afternoon when mom would be at work, then I would bake with my grand, my brother and my sister. And when they, mom, mom and dad used to come home from work, then we used to surprise them with these yummy treats. So I, I love the, the smile and the joy that you get when you place this amazing dish or something so simple in front of someone you love and that appreciation and that excitement, that, that's what I love for. That, that's what I want to get out of it at the end of the day. Nazreen juggles a busy life around her love for her family, baking and her professional career. She completed her master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology and is now a registered practitioner with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. Her son is the love of her life and she makes sure she spends quality time with him. Coming out of Bake Off and working as an industrial psychologist, being a wife, being a mother, I mean, life can get pretty hectic sometimes. And um, what I love is that if I'm busy with an order or if I'm busy experimenting with a flavor or I'm going to try out a new technique, he can be with me in the kitchen and he'll be involved. If he's not physically involved, he's watching me and he's like, Mommy, what are you doing? Oh, I like the color. Or, Mommy, make icing. Mommy, make cupcakes. So he understands what I am doing and also I will tell him this is for a client and this is for something that I'm doing for charity work or for the community and he understands the difference and I explain to him the cause that I'm doing and what I'm trying to do and I do believe he understands what I'm doing so it's like me being able to pass down my passion which I got from my mum which she got from her mum so in other words I'm kind of trying to lay down a legacy going forward you know and hopefully great, great grandkids will remember to say, hey, you know, somewhere down the line, we had a very famous baker who loved what she did and we've learned some of her techniques and that will leave a legacy. Nasreen stint on TV encouraged her to pursue this love of baking even further. She set up a gourmet cooking business and is being inundated with orders. Her cakes are one part experiment, one part recipe, and this makes for all parts yummy. I'm absolutely crazy when it comes to, to my baking repertoire in the sense that I will try anything and everything. I don't always repeat the same recipe twice. Um, if it's absolutely amazing, I'll do it. But I just find that once I've done it and I'm happy with the skill, I'm happy with mastering the technique, then I move on to something else. So, I mean, gosh, I can do anything from cake to meringue to chocolate to sugar. Sugar is my new thing. I'm very much a dessert fan and a pastry fan as well. So I think I'm trying to steer away from the cakes and move into something that has a lot more depth and something that has a lot more um, components and creativity, but it's the same thing with the cakes. I mean, you just need to apply different techniques and the sky's the limit. Not content with what she already has, Nasreen is pushing herself further. She's enrolled for a pastry chef course with the aim of refining her skill set 
and learning more about baking under a renowned pastry chef. Chef Nicholas, he's so amazing. I've followed his journey and I kind of, I want to say it's a bit like a stalking kind of thing going on, but to learn from someone that has so much of skill, someone that has passion that exudes in everything that he does, when he talks, you fall in love with what he's doing. And for me, that is someone who I want to follow. And um, yeah, that is why I'm here today. I think for her to pursue this, this career, there's a great future. The world is in hunger for great passion pastry chefs. Um, if she can keep up with the pace and really work on her knowledge and her skills, that she will really be one of the top chefs in the world. Nasreen has managed to put together just the right amount of ingredients to fulfill her life with all she requires. She's proudly blazing a path of her own. As her star rises, so too does her cakes and confectionery. Maulana Ibrahim Baum is a well-respected scholar of Islam with a wealth of knowledge that he graciously shares with you, our loyal viewers. Here is this week's Q&A. Beginning the program in the name of the Almighty and praising the Almighty for the Almighty's favors upon humanity. Salutations be upon the messengers and the prophets of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of them including and especially the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those who follow them in righteousness and guidance. Today we have certain questions that have been posed in the Q&A segment of the Anur program. One is it, how is it that Kaaba is the house of Allah when it was built by Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam and his son? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam was not an Arab, so how can you say it is the house of the Almighty? Bear in mind, we believe that the Kaaba is the house of the Almighty. It has nothing to do with ethnicity or race or with regard to being an Arab or a non-Arab. We firmly believe, Nabi Karim Wasallam has said in a hadith which appears in the hadith compilation of Sahih Muslim, that the first house of the Almighty, the first place, and the house of the Almighty doesn't mean that the favors of the Almighty or the blessings of the Almighty or the majesty of the Almighty does not come on other places, but it is more specifically focused. And the houses of the Almighty, wherever they are, Therefore, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the hadith, the best place on this earth is the houses of the Almighty. And out of the houses of the Almighty, the one which garners the most blessings of the Almighty is the one in Kaaba and Baytullah in Makkah and Mukarramah. That is our belief. It was the first house of the Almighty upon this earth. It was then rebuilt in various phases. By Hazrat Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, and many other prophets prior to it being rebuilt by Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. So this aspect that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam is the founder or the first one to build the Kaaba and Baytullah is not correct. It was built in the, from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wa salam from the inception of humanity. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam did give it further significance and something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, وَإِذْ يَرْفَوْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَائِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ And recall the time when Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam with his son Ismail put up the Kaaba, constructed, and then after they said, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا أَوَ اللَّهِ أَكْسَبْ فَرَمْ أَسْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ You are all hearing, all knowing. And of course, we know from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, then his progeny went into two directions. One, Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam, the father of Arabs, and the other one is Haq and Yaqub alayhi salatu wa salam, who is the father of the Jews. So the aspect doesn't really come into play because the aspect of the Kaaba is beyond any race and ethnicity. It is to do with the oneness and the greatness of the Almighty. Someone has asked a question. I'm a young South African Muslim. I was from a different faith group before I converted. I love Islam, but I'm finding it difficult to learn Arabic. To learn Arabic is not a compulsion for you to be a Muslim, right? This aspect that I have to learn Arabic to become a Muslim, no. It would be recommended, it would be good, you would be able to understand aspects of the Quran. It's good if a person, if he finds the ability to do so, if he finds the time. But bear in mind, many a times people revert when they are quite advanced in age, to expect them to learn a completely new religion, a new language, might not necessarily be required. It's not an obligation. However, giving this in mind, what is required is to learn the necessary phrases to perform our salah. Now that is not that difficult comparative to learning an entire language. 
So learn those, for example, Surah Fatiha has seven verses. Learn those, learn few verses, and slowly whatever you can learn so that you can be able to read your Salat in Arabic, which is a requirement. So what is required is not learning the entire Arabic language, only those uh, surahs and chapters of the Holy Quran through which you can recite your Salah. Uh, which is more important, someone has asked the proper pronunciation of the Quran or the memorization of the Quran. The entire memorization of the Quran is not a compulsion or an obligation. It is recommended, it is very meritorious, it is full of reward, but it is not compulsory. Memorization, only that much which perform your Salat, that is important. So comparative to the two, pronunciation is more important, but memorization to the extent of being able to perform your Salat is compulsory. Hope that suffices. And that's all what we have time for today. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Do remember that if you have any questions for Maulana, whether it be public or personal, just get in touch with us via our social media pages and we'll pass it on to Maulana Baum. Talking of which, social media has blown up in ways we couldn't even imagine. But there are certain ethics and rules which must be adhered to, and we went to find out more. Social media is one of the fastest growing applications globally. More and more people are turning to it for news, connecting with others, or just to have fun. There are many benefits, but there's also huge risk to potential users. Posting pictures or updates about one's whereabouts poses a security threat, and we have to be careful as well as vigilant about this. It may be computer or device-based, but this does not disqualify the need for etiquette. I think we can understand it as a technological tool for communication. So the issue of what is good about it is the fact that effectively it enables us to communicate with, you know, friends, family, anyone really, uh, across uh, internet uh, and across, you know, the various uh, in what you would call IT platforms. So whether you're using Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any of the platforms, you're basically putting a message out there, you're communicating, and communication is good. There's many benefits benefits to social media, um, being out there, understanding what's happening in the world, having your fingers on the pulse. And there's also downsides, so everything has a pro and con to it, and it's how you actually use it and respect it. Um, if you're using it for your business, it's very informative, it's helpful to get your brand out there, and it's helpful for people to actually be able to communicate with you and to be able to get information back from you regarding your brand. So in that sense, it's really helpful for small businesses, even medium and large businesses. Social media has always been just another chance to form bonds with people by being respectful, helpful, engaging and authentic. Today, family and friends can often be seen using the platform to bring about dirty laundry, insulting each other and going as far as naming and shaming loved ones on social media. But I think what's important to remember is that basically you have to remember that this is a social space and it's a public space. So what you say, how you conduct yourself, it's very much like standing on a street and having a conversation, but you're just doing it on the internet. So if you were standing on the street, how would you speak? What would you say? Would you behave yourself or would you conduct yourself in a way that is inappropriate? So I think those are the considerations that we actually have to think about. In terms of policing, what we have to remember is that there are moral codes that we actually have to abide by. I think it's a question also of what is it that is appropriate to say in a public space and what is inappropriate. We've had instances where people have expressed, for example, racism uh, on social media and they've been, you know, prosecuted because it is illegal to express yourself in certain ways that is hate speech. So I think the question of policing is something that we have to regulate ourselves. As we share more of our lives online and in public spaces, the risk to our safety is increased. We need to limit the information we post so as not to endanger ourselves, as criminals are getting more tech-savvy and using this to commit crimes. Social media can be beneficial if used correctly or it can harm us. Vigilance is needed as it becomes a big part of our lives. I think where there is merit, if someone has expressed hate speech, if someone has discriminated against somebody else, 
you know, in whatever ways the South African legal system uh, protects, then actually I think the police would have to step in. So there's a fine line between what constitutes reporting hate speech and what constitutes someone just expressing themselves uh, on social justice issues. As with most things in life, there are certain rules to follow and it's good to know these. The do's and don'ts are only a guideline and common sense is what is needed to have a good online experience. For me, I see social media the same way that I would interact with the person in face to face. So if you wouldn't tell them anything face to face, why are you putting it online? So definitely be respectful and mindful of people uh, online. That's definitely due for me. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, taking a picture and posting it, you could still see a small kid in the background. Make sure that you have, you know, full respect of that kid. Understand that you can't actually put children online without, you know, consent and things like that. So again, very mindful of people, where you are, what, uh, kind of information you're sharing. Um, definite no-no for me is, again, if you don't, if you can't say something to a person face-to-face, -face, you shouldn't say it online. That's like, without doubt, something that I stick with. Social media is here to stay, and we need to use it to our benefit instead of our detriment. It presents opportunities for connection and collaboration, but it can also be the cause of conflict. As we navigate this new world online, it's good to remember the norms our society lives by and use social media as a basis to inform what we post. The future will be online. Please bear in mind that security and privacy shouldn't be compromised by sharing too much information on social media. Next up is this week's travel segment from Gauteng. Whether you're a military buff or just like seeing weapons of war up close, this is one place to visit next time you're in Johannesburg. The Museum of Military History is the place to see some of South Africa's greatest military inventions as well as a whole lot more. This is the National Military History Museum of South Africa. Originally the museum was started as a memorial to South Africa's role in the Second World War. So it was originally uh, put together to tell the history of South Africa's role in both those war, wars and from there onwards. However, during the 1970s, a decision was made that this museum would tell the entire military history of South Africa, so it goes back as far as it possibly can. In it, you will find the extraordinary history of the armed forces, both past and present. There are also rare aircraft that have seen action in both world wars and are still in impeccable condition. There's the only surviving two-seater night fighter version of the Messerschmitt Me 262. That was the first jet fighter ever used in action during the Second World War. There are two aircraft here that are the only surviving aircraft of the Imperial Gift. We have vehicles here, tanks and armored cars, guns, uh, small arms and uh, edged weapons, those are swords, bayonets and such. This is not only a visit for enthusiasts of military, but rather an experience for all to see firsthand the amazing display that is on offer. The museum is open daily from 9 a.m. to 4.30 in the afternoon, and money is well spent. You've seen his skills on the cooking TV show, and now those fortunate enough to live in Johannesburg can try out his new dining experience. It promises to be something familiar, but different, just like the man himself. My love for cooking started a long time ago. I was in boarding school as a, as a youngster, and um, obviously having to eat mass food every day uh, became a bit difficult. And I come from a family which enjoys really good food. And obviously I've spent a lot of time with my mom in the kitchen and learning new recipes and seeing different ideas. Ozzy's kitchen is my playground. It's a space where I can be myself and be free and express myself on a plate. Um, it started about six months ago for me where I decided to go on my own and start a new venture with a partner of mine, Riza. And uh, it's a very contemporary space and we took a take on casual fine dining. And uh, it's not anything sophisticated or very uh, formal. It's a very casual setting where families can come and enjoy good food 
in your own comfort. Ozzy is taking home cooking and turning it on its head by mixing flavors and textures with a twist. A key component to his food is his presentation, which adds a whole new style to his concept. There's um, that feeling of you coming home, eating in your mother's house, or but not being able to take the same recipes home and replicating it. And that's the reason why I want you to come eat at Ozzy's Kitchen. It's always a gastronomical experience. It's something new, it's something innovating. And it's not just binded by a menu. You know, if, my, if I walk up to my guests, I'm gonna ask you, what are you in the mood for today? So that piece of paper doesn't start and end all at the table. You can tell me what you're in the mood for and I'll create something exotic and delicious for you. This is not your typical one of the mall restaurant and offers Muslims in Johannesburg a true fine dining experience in a casual setup. Ozzy is passionate about his food and it shows when the plate arrives on the table. Archery was one of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's favorite pastimes and there are opportunities to experience it in the presence of trained instructors. Archery, well, it's something I think that a lot of people don't have an opportunity to do in day-to-day -day life. So we actually use archery as part of a game we call Survivor. And so we will let you, a company choose five games that they can play, and Survivor is one of those. And then it works, number one, we teach you, so it's a bit of a master class on how to do archery. And then you, you shoot the archers, and it's how many, how many points you get per, per shooting. Many companies often have team building exercises that are both fun and entertaining, and the same happens here. Instead of doing it with your company, why not challenge your family and friends to an afternoon out? We do activities for corporates, helping them build teams, teaching them to collaborate, and helping them work better as a, as a company. If you have a team that really works closely together, you can only be more successful. So a lot of our activities are about collaboration, how to work better as a team, and really that is, the better your team is, the better you're going to do in business. There are many activities on offer, and all in all, it makes for a fun day with loved ones. Booking is essential and weekends can get full very quickly, but it's better than spending time in the shopping mall or on the couch. Through these travel segments, we've seen quite a bit of the country and I'm sure for those regular viewers, there is a good bucket list of places to see, things to do and where to eat. I hope you send us pics should you be visiting anywhere and let us know what it was like. Time for me to love and leave you. From me, Mara Mukwanda, Salang Hantle, Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> Words that had been heard, the greatest man to walk the